love that you all came out to show uh, Gerard Summer Enchanted Evening for this evening. It's going to be a good one. Um, uh, your chair, you should have found some propaganda. This talks about what's coming up at Volcano. Um, we've got our schedule on here. Next week, um, our Summer Enchanted Evening is going to be about wildflowers, which I think is so appropriate because if you, uh, well, maybe not tonight when you go be dark, but the wildflowers in front of our homestead cabin are just spectacular right now. I love our columbines and, and everything. I think and maybe we should have a show and tell, but uh, I'm sure she'll have great pictures and show us all about it. Um, also on here, you're going to find out what other events we have coming up. You know, we in the Keys and Christmas in July and all those crazy things. So, uh, you'll want to get those on your calendar. Um, and on the back, just information about stuff, our breakfast of all pay, and um, more propaganda. So, uh, um, I would, uh, I forgot to mention this last week, but it didn't happen. So, you may want to turn off your phone if you happen to have it on. I have one set up my phone all the time and they go off to those awkward places. So, we are live streaming, we hope. Uh, we're having a little lunch here with uh, those of you who are, are, are tuning in on YouTube. Uh, don't know that I'm like crazy here. And all these people in the room had to fight the rain to get in here. So, thank for them. But uh, tonight we are proud to be uh, introducing one of our museum curators. Um, Adam is, I uh, asked him what he want, wanted me to say. And he said, well, just, I, I just graduated. So, I'm saying that. Just graduate. He'll, he can probably tell you more about that. And he is one of our curators. What I want to tell you is that um, Volpate has kind of had their own Caldwells over the years. And if you're from this park, you know that we love Tommy Caldwell. And uh, Brad Martin was one of our first. And if you've been here before, he's done some talks on climbing and hiking in the Rockies. And he was one of the things that for nine years here, if you can believe it or not. I uh, didn't scare him away, so but, um, another and so we're glad to have another family. Adam uh, got here fairly early on. Adam got here fairly early on. So we had to push our opening. Some of you know we had to push our opening. Um, because of us. And uh, Adam got here early. And so uh, Adam got here early. So he was uh, fine to work with all day, like scrubbing down every window and beam and uh, mopping the floors and doing all the stuff we have to do at the beginning of the season to get open. So um, he gets extra kudos for being on that first team. Um, he, he went the first one through the door, but he was here just a couple days later and, and got to do all the fun work too. So anyways, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce Adam. Yippee Adam! Oh, and Jim was all climbing there. I hope you yeah. didn't make us do that. I said there'd be a little, little show and tell, so I brought some, some gear of different sorts. Um, yeah, welcome to my talk, obviously. Uh, thank you for coming uh, in our famous afternoon storms. Uh, let me grab this little clicker. So just to do first things first, a little bit of my gear. So these are my climbing shoes that I've been wearing for a while now. Uh, you can see they're very, got very sharp edges to them and they're made of very sticky rubber. Um, and I've got some other collections of different artifacts and stuff for uh, trad climbing, which I'll get into in just a minute. Okay, so there we go. Uh, I wanted to do my talk about climbing, but I didn't want to do it about just, you know, peak bagging and going up and tagging a summit. So I really wanted to look at the actual rock climbing around Estes. Uh, and of course, you can't forget Long's Peak because it's, you know, right there always. So first things first, I wanted to do a little acknowledgement of uh, indigenous occupants that have been living in these areas for thousands of years um, before white settlers such as Joel Estes and moved into this area there was tribes such as the Utes and the uh, Arapaho who lived in this area and their names of places still kind of carry on to this day um, yeah so their homelands must be recognized and stories from Arapaho tell us of different mountain climbs that they would do um, and different peaks that were summited long before white settlers came here. So I just wanted to start with that. Um, so uh, the two guides are the two tallest peaks around this area. You have Mount Merker and Long's Peak. 
where you can see pretty much throughout Rocky Mountain National Park and throughout the surrounding area. They were used as guides because they could always kind of position yourself using these, you know, very, oops, let me turn it off, these large, you know, peaks and you see the diamond here and this is kind of a wintry shot covered in snow looks really really treacherous um, yeah so a lot of the climbing that I'm going to be talking about happens in the summertime where the rock is dry and free climbable so just to touch on some climbing grades um, you have the Yosemite decimal system which is kind of the standard for climbing in America you have first class which is just like walking you know, on a path. Second class, kind of steep hills. Third class, kind of getting into scrambling. And um, fourth class, getting into scrambling with some consequence. So if you fall, you might get hurt on fourth class terrain. And then finally, getting into um, fifth class, which is the technical rock climbing, which is my bread and butter. Uh, then you have grades from 5.0 to 5.9. And then it gets a little complicated. So after 5.9, they didn't think there'd be climbs harder than 5.9, so then they started adding 10, and 5.10 doesn't really make any sense, but then they added uh, letters to it. So you have 10A through D, and these grades go all the way up to 15D, which is the hardest rock climb in the world, which is recently put up by uh, a Czech climber in Norway. Uh, and then for a little bit of a further confusion to the grades, you have kind of classes. You have Grade one, which is like a few hours worth of climbing, uh, and then all the way up to grades five and six, which are uh, require multi-day climbing, staying overnight on the wall, sometimes in a portal ledge, which I'm sure some of you have seen, which is the huge kind of beds that people strap to the wall. That stuff is really cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's my favorite stuff. I, I want to do some of the longer routes someday. Uh, so getting a little bit more into technical climbing, some of the early sense of the flat irons, yeah, in the 1870s were examples of technical climbing. So that's 5-0 and up, uh, where if you fall, you could get seriously hurt or killed. Um, and using hands and feet to climb hard rock faces. Uh, and then the first 5-0 climb on Long's Peak was actually a descent by um, Reverend Elka Lamb, I think is his name, and he kind of went up Long's Peak and decided to go down a different way than he came up and ended up doing some really scary climbing up on Long's Peak way before uh, people were really actively rock climbing up there. Um, the north face of Long's Peak was summited around 1910, and then Joe and Paul uh, Stettner in 1927 established the first 5-8 um, on uh, Long's Peak and their route was one of the hardest routes for the next 30 years. It wouldn't be kind of matched until the 1950s. Um, there are over, I, this is, I was shocked to learn this, there are over 1,200 climbing routes in the Estes Park Valley. So that includes Lumpy Ridge um, and all the surrounding crags of this area. If you drive around, you'll see them. They're everywhere. It's incredible. Uh, a lot of the climbing is granite, especially in the Alpine, but some of the uh, Lower elevation crags are nice and schist, and there are routes from 7,000 feet to 11,000 feet, um, and that includes the technical climbing that I mentioned. So I want to get into the difference between free climbing and aid climbing. Uh, free climbing is using hands and feet and those fancy little shoes that I have, and uh, climber's chalk, which helps keep your hands dry, and use the rope only for protection. So you can see in this picture, you know, reaching up for small holds and balancing on really small feet. That's the, the free climbing aspect. While aid climbing is using your gear directly to ascend. And it's kind of an any means necessary get up this one section of wall. Um, and then you have cams, which are devices that have spring-loaded lobes. And then hooks, which are uh, little pieces of metal that hook onto little ledges. And then pitons, which are kind of wedges of metal uh, that you bang into rocks with a hammer. Uh, and then it goes even further between sport climbing and trad climbing, which is more of a uh, difference of climbing today. You see in sport climbing uh, these bolts, which are kind of steel or titanium, 
and they're bolted to about five eighths of an inch into the rock and they're really solid like you can take big falls and still be held by these little things they're actually like the size of a quarter about uh, and then you have placing your own protection is trad climbing and you see this picture he's got one of the the cams that i brought and i'll try to show a little bit later where you place the protection into the crack and then clip your rope into it and that's just kind of the games that we play in climbing are do you clip into the bolts or do you place your own gear or vice versa uh, so a little bit more about climbing gear so you have all different variations of gear here uh, you have your rope which is a standard uh, nylon rope with uh, a sheath and a core that sheath kind of protects the outside while the core is really the strong part of it and it can run over jagged edges and you can use them for you know lots of climbs originally uh, a lot of climbers used hemp ropes which is really scary because there's no dynamic nature to hemp ropes so if you took a fall your rope could snap so nylon ropes are much better because they have um, very stretchy parts into them so that they uh, kind of arrest your fall naturally uh, and then over there I have a picture of a micro traction which is a nice little pulley device that has uh, teeth that basically allows the rope to go in one direction and not the other those have been revolutionary in climbing uh, areas like Yosemite for practicing hard climbs without the risk of falling uh, and then you see the kind of example of a hammer that would be carried in the 50s or 60s when you're bashing in uh, metal pitons into cracks. Okay, so starting with Long's Peak, obviously it's the crown jewel of this area. It's got tons of climbing on it everywhere. You can see the sheer vertical face just is calling to me right now. <laughs> it's, it's got all sorts of routes all the way up these cracks, and it's got free climbing up to 513 on it, which is very, very hard, and actually put up by our local Tommy Caldwell, so that's very nice. Uh, some of the routes that are a little bit easier, though, are like what people usually do when they want to summit Long's Peak. You have the keyhole route, which kind of sneaks up the back and goes around to the north face, and then up the keyhole, which is at like 13,000 feet. It's really cool. It's got you beautiful rock everywhere, and then uh, let's see. Some other routes you have is Keener's route, which kind of goes up the east face ledges. So Keener's kind of follows this and then goes through this little couloir, which is a uh, kind of a giant gap between two big peaks, and then goes around the backside, and that's Keener's route. Um, just some of the earliest uh, ascents of Long's Peak. There's the first documented ascent, which wasn't the first ascent whatsoever. Uh, in, or in 1868, but the first ascent came much earlier, and there's evidence of eagle pits up on the top of the mountain where they would rearrange rocks to trap eagles and other raptors. So that was found during the, the first documented ascent, but it was definitely already climbed by Ute and Arapaho indigenous people, um, just because it's such an incredible place to be, and uh, it just calls to all the climbers who want to take on a big challenge. So this is a little topographic map. Uh, the standard keyhole route goes up this ridge here and then goes up and the keyhole's right around here and then you summit that way. But what I really want to focus on tonight is the other face. You see all these lines bunched together. So that's the diamond which is the steepest, most difficult part of Long's Peak and then you have the chasm view wall which is kind of in this area and then you have um, the slide right here so this is the east face and is seen the most kind of technical rock climbing sense yeah so that's just another picture you can see some of the ledges in this picture uh, right here there's a ledge that goes across called table table ledge uh, a lot of the routes that go up the beginning part of the diamond hit the table ledge and traverse off the face to the right there. Uh, and then you see the chasm view wall really lit up by sunlight in this picture. Um, just absolutely incredible. Uh, so this is the Reverend Elkham, Elk 
Elkanah Lamb, uh, and he was one of the pioneers of this area for white settlers, um, and he did the descent of Lamb's Slide, and it was said that he fell about 500 to 300 feet down the slide while he was climbing and miraculously survived and was uh, okay to walk off the mountain. Yeah, this, this is the slide right here that he fell down. Yeah, and then, yeah. So where it really gets into the real technical stuff is when um, the outside Europeans started coming to America to kind of bag some of the amazing lines. And Paul and Joe Stettiner were two Bavarian climbers who kind of brought a new level of difficulty to climbing on Long's Peak. And this is a picture of Joe following his brother up the first ascent. Originally, Paul was the stronger climber, um, and he led every pitch. Um, so every l rope length that they had to go up, he led uh, for their first ascent of their route. Um, and actually, there's a funny story about how they had got their rope. They expected to um, borrow somebody's rope in the Long's Peak Inn, but he refused to give it to them. So they had to go down to the Estes Park General Store and buy 120 feet of hemp rope. And then they went up and climbed the diamond. So it was really cool. And this is their route right here. Went up to this ledge called Broadway Ledge, which is kind of the main camping uh, bivy spot, which is the kind of jumping off point for a lot of the routes up the diamond. And then they climbed up the east face uh, out of the slide, out of Lamb Slide up to the notch, and then they summited straight up the diamond. So it was 5'8", and at the time it was 1927, I believe. That was by far the hardest alpine climb in North America. So another thing that I wanted to get into after Long's Peak is Lumpy Ridge, which is the incredible ridge of granite that you can see pretty much all throughout town. Um, it's got beautiful uh, faces all over it. You got Sundance Buttress over here, and then the Twin Owls, which are, I think, my favorite formation just because how cool they look. Uh, I haven't climbed on them yet, but I'm hoping to very soon after the Raptor closure ends. So sometimes these peaks are closed for uh, nesting. So the closed peaks are Sundance and Twin Owls and the Pear, which is in here. Uh, and they're all closed until uh, late July, unfortunately. So left to right, you have Sundance Buttress, Thunder Buttress, so on and so forth, uh, all the way to the Crescent Wall, which is on the very eastern edge of Lumpy Ridge. So to get into the history of it a little bit, um, I want to start by talking about this guy, whose name is Leighton Core, And he was um, probably the strongest rock climber in Colorado in the 1960s. He climbed from the late 50s to kind of the late 60s, and that was his main um, stretch of doing first ascents and hard rock climbs. You can see him here doing an aid climb, hanging off this little bolt right here on this huge overhanging face. I think this was taken in Boulder Canyon. Um, but Leighton Core was one of the uh, pioneers of actual technical rock climbing. Uh, he put up hundreds of ascents on Lumpy Ridge, a lot of them we actually have no documentation for it because he would just do it in an afternoon and not tell anybody about it. Um, but a lot of them we do have documentation for, especially his climbs on the diamond. Um, and he did one of the harder routes, not on the diamond itself, but kind of on the chasm view wall called the diagonal with Ray Northcutt, um, who was probably the strongest climber in the 50s. So it kind of transitioned from Northcutt to core um, who was really the cutting edge uh, climbers in these days. And you can see him doing some free climbing here where he's barely on the rock at all and very uh, steep overhanging rock. Um, he was really known for his trick climbing ability, which is also known today as bouldering, where you just try to do as mo the most difficult moves on the rock that you possibly can. Um, on small boulders or uh, low-hanging faces and stuff like that. Um, so he was one of the first actual climbers to train. His um, routine is legendary. He would do 
100 push-ups a day and do hard trail running and do tons of pull-ups. And he was the first person to really be able to dedicate a lot of his time just strictly to training and climbing. Uh, unfortunately, he was also a professor at <laughs> University of Montana, so he had to take some time off to be a professor and not dedicate so much time to rock climbing. And he actually gave a lot of his gear to Leighton Core to be able to do some of the first ascents that they uh, did in Colorado. Um, oh yeah, and there's a great story about in El Dorado Canyon, um, which is just south of uh, Boulder, in between Boulder and Denver, um, where the, bas the Bastille Crack, which is like the main face of the whole area, it's huge, it's like, you know, 600 feet tall, and some of his climbing partners told him that Leighton Core did the first free ascent of this uh, direct start to the Bastille Crack. And Ray Northcutt was like, well, if Leighton Core can do it, I can do it. So he went up and climbed um, what is kind of considered one of the hardest leads in the country at the time. And at when he got to the top, he was like so exhausted. There was nothing to hang on to. But he, he did it. And his climbing partner then later said, like, oh, yeah, Leighton Core didn't do that. Like, you were the first one to do that. So that's just a cool story about kind of the um, early climbing community in Colorado. So moving from the 1950s and 60s into the 1970s, uh, you have the Fantasy Ridge crew. Um, so you see this is uh, Jim Bridwell, who's legendary in Yosemite for all sorts of climbing ascents that he did. And you have right here Billy West Bay, who I'll get into a little bit more later. But that was the main crew in the 1970s. And the Fantasy Ridge was the first kind of modern uh, rock climbing guide service in Estes Park. Um, some of the best climbers were recruited and they would spend their, their summers here uh, doing guided trips. And then while they're not good doing guided trips, they're putting up first ascents. So they put up uh, a ton of uh, ascents on Lumpy Ridge, um, including some of the hardest routes on Lumpy Ridge was done by this uh, crew. So they needed a base for their operations. And that's where Steve Co uh, Comito and Michael Covington came in. Um, Michael Covington was the guide of the two. And Steve Camino kind of had his own boot shop where he would repair uh, climbing boots and stuff like that. You can see some of the racks here, some of the early, early gear. So this is uh, Camino and this is uh, Covington. Um, the original guides for Fantasy Ridge were Billy West Bay, Dan McC uh, McClure, uh, Doug Snively, and Mark Hess. And those guys' names pop up all over the first ascent lists of Lumpy Ridge and Longs Peak and all the climbing around Estes. Um, just a cool little fact, Covington was from Steamboat Springs, and he was actually close friends with Simon and Garfunkel. And he was offered a record contract in New York, but traded it all away to be uh, a simple mountain guide up in Estes. So it's definitely a, a place that attracts a lot of you know, bohemian figures and stuff like that. And they would all stay at the boot shop um, which used to be the Larimer County offices, and they transferred it into this uh, kind of climbing shop where people would stay um, before they would do their climbs. So this is Billy West Bay with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, and the background is the uh, nose of El Cap. Uh, one thing that Billy is really famous for is his in, uh, first in a day ascent of the nose. And um, I'm sorry, this is actually not Billy. This is Billy. Um, but they did the first ascent of the nose in a day, which was like the main um, prize of Yosemite, where they had to go up this 3,000 foot peak in 24 hours. Um, and that kind of in a day mentality kind of became the standard for um, climbers and climbing is how much climbing can you do in one day? And Billy West Bay was at the forefront of this. And you can see the, the 70s outfits, which I really enjoy. Um, you don't see much of that anymore, unfortunately. So another pioneer of specifically climbing on the diamond was Roger Briggs. Um, you can see him here. He's 17 uh, and camping on Broadway Ledge. Um, his 
kind of main focus was transferring the aid climbing of the 1960s and, and some into the 70s into pure free climbing, which is scrapping all the heavy gear and just going with your hands and feet and doing as much as you can. Uh, and he put up a lot of great lines, including the first free ascent of D7, which if I can go back to this, D7 runs straight up the face and follows this crack system right from the base of the wall to the very top of the wall. Um, it was D7 because it was the seventh route put up on the diamond. Um, and D1, which was a route that kind of went a little to the right of it, was also free climbed in the 70s. So, ah, and of course, we have Michael and Tommy Caldwell. You can see um, this is Mike when he was um, probably in his 30s, I guess, and Tommy when he was just uh, like 12 or something. Like, he climbed. The diamond when he was 12, which is an incredible feat, uh, especially considering that the diamond is one of the most technically difficult um, climbing areas in the entire country. And they're local uh, Estes Parkers. So Michael is actually from Southern California and trained in Yosemite and kind of cut his teeth there. And Tommy was brought up here and kind of transformed climbing from the 511 to 512 to more 513, 514. And that was a big jump in Colorado climbing. Um, yeah, and he's the, Tommy, this little kid here, put up the first 513 on the diamond. And I think the route is called Return to Sender or something like that. And it goes right up the head wall. And it's like amazing climbing. Just the, this pair was uh, instrumental in bringing modern rock climbing to Estes Park. So I want to talk a little more about the specific routes that have been done. Um, if you look here, you see the twin owls. You have the west owl and the east owl, uh, and then this giant crack that goes right in between them. Um, some of the hardest routes on Lumpy Ridge have been put up in the owls. And I'm going to talk about the crack of fear. So one thing I really love about uh, rock climbing routes is that they all get great names. And the crack of fear, I think, perfect name for this. You see this big flared crack and it goes right up that part of the eastern owl and it's completely flared out and to climb it is an incredible feat and I, I hope to do it one day but it's you know really intimidating and scary because it's so uh, exposed and so difficult as far as free climbing goes. Uh, it's 400 feet uh, in length, the crack of fear, and it was first ascended by uh, Leighton Core and Paul Melrose in 1963. So imagine not having the really fancy shoes and not having the climbing chalk and the um, the cams and all that gear, climbing this huge crack. So aptly named crack of fear. Um, first free ascent. So they the first party that climbed it did it in aid aid style. So they were bashing in pitons and kind of stepping up in their um, step ladders to climb this route. And the first free ascent was done by Chris Fredericks and Jamie Logan in 1966. And it's actually said that um, Jamie Logan was so skinny that he was able to uh, chimney into the crack. So that's fitting your whole body into this little thin crack, while most climbers have to do it in a style known as off-width climbing. So it's a when you climb a crack, you either climb it with your, your hand like this, or your fist, or uh, once it gets into bigger sizes, you chimney by like sticking your whole body in and just kind of squirming up it. But in between that is off with climbing, and it's one of the most hated types of climbing, just because it's so physically demanding. And s it's like uh, a good description of it would be, imagine if you're in a Pilates class and somebody says, you got to hold that position. And if you don't hold that position, you're going to slip out of the crack. And also, somebody is sandpapering skin off you while you're doing it. So it's kind of brutal. Um, more routes on the Twin Owls. You can see a big list of them up here and kind of where they are on the formation. Um, Peaches and Cream, which is another nice name, I think. It goes up uh, right next to the. So yeah, 
Trachosphere is right here. And then Peaches and Cream is on the further eastern side. Um, and that was one of the hardest free ascents done. It was done in 1974, um, all, all free by Dan McClure. Um, and it would be the hardest route on Lumpy Ridge for the next four years. It was an incredible ascent. And um, it would only be matched by the West Owl Direct, which is right here. It goes up this beautiful uh, dihedral, which is two rocks coming together to form a corner. And it goes right up that roof. And I think it's the next slide. Yeah. Um, so that route, West Owl Direct, um, was then renamed Silly Putty uh, by the first ascensionist, John Backer, uh, in 1978. And one thing that I really uh, like about uh, climbing names is that the first ascensionist who did it on aid get to choose a name. And then if you climb it free, you get to choose a new name. So it's kind of two routes in one, which I think is really cool. Uh, he, he rated it 511R. I didn't put the R in there. But basically, uh, the R stands for really scary, like, <laughs> like you know, really intense. Um, and it was actually. Uh, upgraded from 5.11 to 5.12 on later ascents because everybody said, this is you know, too hard to be 5.11. It's got to be 5.12. And this one was the hardest free climb since Peaches and Cream, and it actually remain the hardest free line for the next 20 years on the Owls. Uh, and then getting into some more of the popular climbing. So the Owls are, are great, but all the routes there are really hard. So some of the more uh, moderate climbs are on the book. As you can see here, it opens just like a book. And you have, I think, the different areas inside the book are the bookmark, bookend, uh, other book puns, any, any, uh, anything that they could kind of play off the book they, they did, which I think is really cool. Um, the hardest route in the book is called J Crack. And you can see it here. This is kind of the top of the crack towards the head wall. And it follows kind of some easy 5.9 climbing up into the head wall, which is the 5.11 section. Uh, it was A climbed in 1964, but first free climbed again by Dan McClure. And it was the first 5.11 put up on Lumpy Ridge. Oops. Um, let's see. And then also in the book, you have Fat City Crack, which is this beautiful crack system that goes right up here. Um, that was uh, first free climbed in 1970 by Bill Forrest and Ray Jardine. Uh, Ray Jardine would actually go on to invent uh, the camming devices that are used in cracks today. Uh, he initially called them friends, which interesting name because he didn't want um, he didn't want everybody to know that he was climbing with new gear than everybody else. So when people would ask him, he'd be like, "Oh, I'm going to go climb with my friends." <laughs> so that was pretty interesting. Um, it was originally Aiden climbed at 5.7 A1. And that little A1 stands for Aid 1. Um, and the A root, or the Aid grades go from A1 to A5. One being just uh, simple crack climbing with uh, gear assisted to A5, which is placing tiny little strips of metal in really thin seams. And it's actually said that A5 is only a grade that's possible if you fell off you would die. So A5 is like, whoa, like crazy hard. Um, and it was first free climbed at 510C. So this is the easy section, and then it gets up into the really hard, steep section right there. And then we have the pear, which I think, I can't see a pear in this at all. But I guess it's the pear, because m maybe this is the stem, and then the pear body. I don't know. Uh, but the first hard route in the pair was called slippage. It was done by Leighton Core in 1965. Um, and it's called slippage because it involves uh, a method of climbing called slab climbing, which is basically just using friction and no holds at all to climb blank sections of rock. Um, and that's really, really scary when you don't have uh, bolts to place. Because to protect blank sections, you drill in holes and put in bolts. but Kind of the ethics of the 1960s and 1950s kind of were against bolting um, because it kind of it scars the rock. You can blatantly see the the bolts in the wall. Um, 
so there's kind of a debate between to bolt or not to bolt. Um, and today, many people have decided to bolt. So there's lots of bolts and sport climbing all over. Uh, another route, Heavenly Journey. Uh, starts with a 510 finger crack and then goes to a 510 slab climb. Uh, one of the early 510s put up in uh, the Lumpy Ridge area. Ah, and then I think if the, if the crown jewel isn't the Twin Owls, it's definitely the Sundance Buttress. It's the biggest formation by far on Lumpy Ridge. It's this huge, huge face right here. And then you have the needles up in here as well. Um, but the, the main prize is the big face right here. Um, and then the book, or the pair is kind of right here, and the book is to the, to the right. Um, so an interesting route up on the Sundance Buttress was the turn corner route. It was originally called the Core Turner route because it was climbed by Jack Turner and Leighton Core, and it was kind of um, standard. If you would do a, a big route on a big face, you'd name it after yourself. Um, which I think is kind of boring, but what the first ascensionist did who climbed it free, uh, Royal Robbins in 1964, he took a lot of lead falls, which wasn't very common in the 1960s, which is basically being above your protection and then taking huge falls. And he said, it said that he took four or five big leader falls on this route trying to free climb it. Um, at the, the 510 crux section. So the crux is the hardest part physically of the route. Um, so he said, he said that he took a couple falls and then eventually free climbed it. And then he renamed it kind of a switch of the original name, uh, Turn Corner. So just an interesting little factoid. And then you have Devil's Gulch. And I haven't been to Devil's Gulch, but you can see here some of the face. Uh, this is kind of getting out of Lumpy Ridge and um, moreover, the external um, area. Uh, Big Thompson Canyon, which a lot of you probably have driven through. Um, a lot of the offshoots to that have kind of come in the 1980s and 90s with the advent of sport climbing. Uh, it's also known as Cedar Park, the, the specific climbing area. Um, yeah, And then you have Prospect Mountain, which is very local. Um, if you're driving down Highway 7, you'll drive right past it. And you have a couple uh, formations on that. You have the needle, which is kind of this one. And then the thumb, which is the big lump that you kind of see driving by it. Um, there's actually a 513 route on the thumb that I've been looking at that I want to climb, but hopefully soon. Uh, Delville Rocks is another big place. Um, haven't been there yet, unfortunately. Um, you see some of the green streaks of algae that come down. A lot of difficulty in climbing, especially for first ascensionists, is um, dirty rock or kind of rock that breaks off really easily. It's kind of called, we call it choss. So um, if you see a lot of this, you could run into a lot of choss climbing. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. And then you have the crags, which are our direct neighbors right up the hill or right up the mountain. The, the crags, which are all these areas in here on Twin Sisters. Um, there's great climbing up in there, so I've heard. Um, but the general consensus is that the hike really isn't worth it. Um, to, but there's lots of better places you can go, like Lumpy Ridge. Uh, oh, and then another local, just up Lily Lake, is Jurassic Park, which I have been to and climbed a lot. And you see this big arete right here has one of the most classic climbs uh, all throughout Essex Park Valley. It's known as the Edge of Time, and it follows that uh, really striking arete all the way up there. Um, just to the right off, off this picture, you have the dinosaur's foot, and then to the right you have the long wall, which is kind of this direction. Um, I know exactly that it takes 21 minutes to hike up to this spot, exactly right here. Uh, from this spot. So I've timed it a bunch, and 21 minutes is the fastest that I've gone. Um, so this is a picture of a crag called the Monastery. It has some of the hardest 513 routes uh, in Colorado and some 514 routes. It actually has four different uh, 514 routes in it, all 
uh, first ascended by Tommy Caldwell. This is kind of the, the baby of Mike and Tommy. Um, they were the ones to put the bolts in and really work the area and kind of develop the crag. Um, so developing crags is kind of something that is more popular today. It's cutting a trail to the base, putting bolts in the wall, um, and making climbing possible where it wasn't before. Um, yeah, that's all I have. So thank you for listening. Oh, so I'll show off some of my, my gear. I'll do them one at a time just because they're all in a big bundle. This is my micro traction. It's seen a lot of use. Uh, a lot of the climbing that I did with this, uh, I did in the sea cliffs, the granite sea cliffs of Maine. I lived there for a summer. And basically what I would do is I would repel a sea cliff and then fix my rope. And then this little device would um, belay me to the top. It's really cool. It's a really neat beaner, or, or carabiner, sorry. It's got a little bit of a kind of a interesting shape and a little pocket for the device to go into so it doesn't slide around like crazy. Um, let's see what else I got. This one's uh, a heavy hitter. This one is called uh, a Jumar. It was invented in Switzerland for crevasse rescue, but uh, kind of taken to the, the big walls of Yosemite um, around 1963, 1964. Um, and basically this does, it has some pretty gnarly teeth on the inside here, and it basically slides up the rope, grips the rope, and then you can pull and ascend uh, a free hanging rope. So that this device is really nifty for uh, aid climbing or just ascending rope altogether. It's got this really ergonomic handle too, very nice. Um, I haven't gotten to use this enough, but it's a very cool piece of gear. Um, and probably the piece of gear that I use uh, the most climbing is this little thing here. It's called a Gris Gris. After it's um, made by a French company. And in French, climbing is grimping. So it's Gris Gris. So very French, very interesting. Um, and it kind of opens up. And you stick your rope in there. And then you lock it to yourself. And basically what it does, it acts like a, like a kind of seat belt where um, if there's any tension pulled from above, it kind of locks into place and pinches the rope. So this is the belay device that I use pretty much every time I go climbing. Um, it's got a nice wear and tear on it. I'm thinking about getting a new one, but hopefully my next paycheck comes in soon. Um, yeah, climbing gear, while it's so cool and, and colorful, um, it's also really expensive. So a lot of my er jobs are basically directly funding my climbing. So that's Pretty interesting. Um, let's see what else I got on here. Ah, so to go from aid climbing to free climbing, um, before there were camming devices, there were chalk stones and nuts. Basically, whoops, hunks of metal with little wires on them. And what you do with these is you kind of walk up to a crack, and then you can place it just like that, and it kind of hangs there. This is my favorite one. It's blue, which is really cool, my favorite. And it's got a lot of wear and tear on it, too. Um, but they're all really, really strong. So they have these uh, cable wires. And this one's rated to 11 kilonewtons. So you can really yank on these, um, including leader falls and stuff like that. But the real big innovation in climbing gear went from these little nuts to the friends or cams, like this big one. So they're all numbered. So this is a number four cam, which is about four inches of camming diameter. Um, and basically, you, you walk up to a crack, and you pull the trigger, and it kind of closes, or like this. And then once you let go, it'll spring back to a point where it won't budge out of the crack. And it's got a big stem and a nice extendable sling that allows your rope to run smoothly. So allows this one is really nice. I placed this one 
in quite a few spots to really get me out of trouble. Um, and on the other end of the camming variety, you've got your small little cams. Uh, this one's a C3, so it's much thinner, much smaller. Um, it's got a really neat stem to it. There's springs here for the camming action. Um, and it works the same way as the big ones, just they're a little scarier to use because they're so tiny. They're you think, oh, they're just going to rip right out. But they work really, really yeah, well for climbing. So, uh, And then moving to sport climbing, we have a little nifty thing called a quick draw. So it's two carabiners connected by a very strong a very uh, piece of fabric uh, known as a dog Crazy. bone. Um, uh, basically, when you're climbing, you just uh, clip uh, into the bolt and then bring your rope up, bolt. clip it into there, and then you're and safe. Your so that's sport climbing. Um, that's sport climbing. Um, yeah. Climbing. That's kind of all the gear I have to run ahead. through. Uh, if you'd like to get a closer look, uh, you obviously can. Um, I'll try to re-rack some of it a little bit. But yeah, thank you for coming to my talk. Yes. So I think he's in town here, but that was a couple of years ago, so I'm yeah. not familiar. He went from University of Montana to local Nessus Park. Uh, he never really got back into serious rock climbing after the late 50s. His main uh, concern was that he didn't feel like he was trained enough. Like he didn't feel strong enough because his early training routine was so intense and he was such a strong climber that he didn't feel like he could be where I wanted to be. So he kind of dropped out of the game, and then Leighton Core kind of went up and took his place. Any other questions? Uh, did you happen to attend the uh, Climb On series that, that was at the museum a year or two ago, a couple of years ago? No, unfortunately um, not. Yeah, but that would be really cool it because. It was really exciting. It yeah. My husband and I at the time did all those, and, you know. <laughs> meeting the different uh, oh climbers, yeah many of them in the area yeah these these Tom figures to me there, but mm -hmm. maybe he's out of town climbing somewhere <laughs> yeah a lot of these figures to me are just names in books right now but okay. they're you know still around a lot of them because a lot of this stuff happened in the 50s and 60s mm -hmm. so a lot of these climbers are just hanging around SS Park now so yes. it's a great place to be I was thinking that maybe is it Ray North Park mm -hmm. Uh, apparently, yeah. Apparently? Yeah. He might have been at that series, that Climb On series, maybe. Oh, I would love to meet him. That'd be great. I think I have great. a photograph of him. I was going on taking pictures of all these people. Yeah, yeah. It was very cool. But, and then there was a gentleman that was there. Uh, anybody kind of know Nate Dick? He went down Landslide oh, a few yeah. years ago. Yeah. Landslide is pretty intense. And so. he lived. <laughs> very likely. <laughs> Yeah, a lamb slide is, um, it's rated as a grade five climb, uh -huh. but it's not entirely rock climbing. It's a lot of snow and ice. Mm -hmm. So, cause that kind of part of the wall doesn't get a lot of sun. Mm -hmm. So it's still, it's probably still icy right now. It'd be very difficult to go climb that. He was one of the speakers at that. And it was just interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Well, actually, rappelling is a lot like work, right? Climbing is the fun part, and rappelling is, is the work part. So once you get up something, you got to get down, and setting up your rappel is one of the most stressful times of a climb. Um, basically, you have to make sure you have a really good anchor point, um, and then there's all sorts of... I have actually have a device here for rappelling. Uh, this little green thing, um, it's known as an ATC. So it basically takes in um, both ends, or uh, yeah, both ends of the rope into this device, and then it kind of um, works as a, a pinch, and it goes 
leads through here. And so yeah, rappelling is not my favorite part of climbing. But a lot of these routes um, start you know, ground up, and then you can either walk around or rappel. Um, a lot of the really daring climbs happen before these great tools are invented, and you have rappelling on um, munter hitches. So those are kind of knots you tie, and that stuff's really intense. And before you had the uh, jumar to climb ropes, you used prussic knots. So basically, it's you wrap it around, you wrap a piece of sling around a rope a lot, and then it um, grabs down, and you can slide it up. And so a lot of the 50s and 60s climbing involved a lot more trickery than gear usage because the gear didn't exist yet. And a lot of the climbing gear um, that was introduced in the 1960s and 70s came from army surplus stores. So all the nylon rope that people would use was made um, kind of pioneered by the 10th Mountain Division, uh, which has a base in Colorado somewhere, I think. Um, but yeah, a lot of that gear that people got came from uh, World War II and all the iron pitons and stuff like that that they used for um, mountain warfare in Italy kind of came back and were used for first ascents all over Colorado and in California, Yosemite. And where I'm from, in New York, in the Adirondacks, um, a lot of the climbs there were done in the 50s and 60s after the gear was introduced. Great. Again, thank you all so much for coming. Yeah. I hope I hope it was about an hour. I don't know. Yeah.